Chapters thirty and thirty one of the Portrait of a Lady by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty. She returned on the morrow to Florence under her cousin's escort, and Ralph Touchett, though usually restive under railway discipline, thought very well of the successive hours passed in the train that hurried his companion away from the city now distinguished by gilbert osmond's preference hours that were to form the first stage in a larger scheme of travel miss stackpole had remained behind she was planning a little trip to naples to be carried out with mr bantling's aid isabel was to have three days in florence before the fourth of june the date of mrs touchett's departure and she determined to devote the last of these to her promise to call on pansy osmond her plan however seemed for a moment likely to modify itself in deference to an idea of madame merle's this lady was still at casa touchet but she too was on the point of leaving florence her next station being an ancient castle in the mountains of tuscany the residence of a noble family of that country whose acquaintance she had known them as she said for ever seemed to isabel in the light of certain photographs of their immense crenellated dwelling which her friend was able to show her a precious privilege she mentioned to this fortunate woman that mr osmond had asked her to take a look at his daughter but didn't mention that he had also made her a declaration of love ah comme cela se trouve madame merle exclaimed i myself have been thinking it would be a kindness to pay the child a little visit before i go off we can go together then isabel reasonably said reasonably because the proposal was not uttered in the spirit of enthusiasm she had prefigured her small pilgrimage as made in solitude she should like it better so she was nevertheless prepared to sacrifice this mystic sentiment to her great consideration for her friend that personage finely meditated after all why should we both go having each of us so much to do during these last hours very good i can easily go alone i don't know about your going alone to the house of a handsome bachelor he has been married but so long ago isabel stared when mr osmond's away does it matter they don't know he's away you see they but whom do you mean every one but perhaps it doesn't signify if you were going why shouldn't i isabel asked because i'm an old frump and you're a beautiful young woman granting all that you've not promised how much you think of your promises said the elder woman in mild mockery i think a great deal of my promises does that surprise you you're right madame merle audibly reflected i really think you wish to be kind to the child i wish very much to be kind to her go and see her then no one will be the wiser and tell her i'd have come if you hadn't or rather madame merle added don't tell her she won't care as isabel drove in the publicity of an open vehicle along the winding way which led to mr osmond's hilltop she wondered what her friend had meant by no one's being the wiser once in a while at large intervals this lady whose voyaging discretion as a general thing was rather of the open sea than of the risky channel dropped a remark of ambiguous quality struck a note that sounded false what cared isabel archer for the vulgar judgments of obscure people and did madame merle suppose that she was capable of doing a thing at all if it had to be sneakingly done of course not she must have meant something else something which in the press of the hours that preceded her departure she had not had time to explain isabel would return to this some day there were sorts of things as to which she liked to be clear she heard pansy strumming at the piano in another place as she herself was ushered into mr osmond's drawing-room the little girl was practising and isabel was pleased to think she performed this duty with rigour she immediately came in smoothing down her frock and did the honours of her father's house with a wide-eyed earnestness of courtesy 
Isabel sat there half an hour, and Pansy rose to the occasion as the small winged fairy in the pantomime soars by the aid of the dissimulated wire, not chattering but conversing, and showing the same respectful interest in Isabel's affairs that Isabel was so good to take in hers. Isabel wondered at her. She had never had so directly presented to her nose the white flower of cultivated sweetness. How well the child had been taught, said our admiring young woman, how prettily she had been directed and fashioned, and yet how simple, how natural, how innocent she had been kept. Isabel was fond, ever, of the question of character and quality, of sounding, as who should say, the deep personal mystery, and it had pleased her, up to this time, to be in doubt as to whether this tender slip were not really all-knowing. Was the extremity of her candour but the perfection of self-consciousness? Was it put on to please her father's visitor, or was it the direct expression of an unspotted nature? The hour that Isabel spent in Mr. Osmond's beautiful, empty, dusky rooms, the windows had been half darkened to keep out the heat, and here and there, through an easy crevice, the splendid summer day peeped in, lighting a gleam of faded colour or tarnished gilt in the rich gloom. Her interview with the daughter of the house, I say, effectually settled this question. Pansy was really a blank page, a pure white surface, successfully kept so. She had neither art, nor guile, nor temper, nor talent only two or three small exquisite instincts, for knowing a friend, for avoiding a mistake, for taking care of an old toy or a new frock. Yet to be so tender was to be touching withal, and she could be felt as an easy victim of fate. She would have no will, no power to resist, no sense of her own importance. She would easily be mystified, easily crushed, her force would be all in knowing when and where to cling. She moved about the place with her visitor, who would ask leave to walk through the other rooms again, where Pansy gave her judgment on several works of art. She spoke of her prospects, her occupations, her father's intentions. She was not egotistical, but felt the propriety of supplying the information so distinguished a guest would naturally expect. "'Please tell me,' she said, "'did papa in Rome go to see Madame Catherine? "'He told me he would if he had time. "'Perhaps he had not time. "'Papa likes a great deal of time. "'He wished to speak about my education. "'It isn't finished yet, you know. "'I don't know what they can do with me more, "'but it appears it's far from finished. "'Papa told me one day he thought he would finish it himself. "'For the last year or two at the convent, the masters that teach the tall girls are so very dear. Papa's not rich, and I should be very sorry if he were to pay much money for me, because I don't think I'm worth it. I don't learn quickly enough, and I have no memory. For what I'm told, yes, especially when it's pleasant, but not for what I learn in a book. There was a young girl who was my best friend, and they took her away from the convent when she was fourteen, to make how do you say in English, to make a do? You don't say it in English? I hope it isn't wrong. I only mean they wish to keep the money to marry her. I don't know whether it is for that that papa wishes to keep the money, to marry me. It costs so much to marry, Pansy went on with a sigh. I think papa might make that economy. At any rate, I'm too young to think about it yet, and I don't care for any gentleman." I mean, for any but him. If he were not my papa, I should like to marry him. I would rather be his daughter than the wife of, of some strange person. I miss him very much, but not so much as you might think, for I've been so much away from him. Papa has always been principally for holidays. I miss Madame Catherine almost more, but you must not tell him that. You shall not see him again? I'm very sorry, and he'll be sorry, too. Of every one who comes here, I like you the best. That's not a great compliment, for there are not many people. It was very kind of you to come today so far from your house, for I'm really as yet only a child. 
Oh, yes, I've only the occupations of a child. When did you give them up, the occupations of a child? I should like to know how old you are, but I don't know whether it's right to ask. At the convent they told us that we must never ask the age. I don't like to do anything that's not expected. It looks as if one had not been properly taught. I myself, I should never like to be taken by surprise. Papa left directions for everything. I go to bed very early. When the sun goes off that side, I go into the garden. Papa left strict orders that I was not to get scorched. I always enjoy the view. The mountains are so graceful. In Rome, from the convent, we saw nothing but roofs and bell towers. I practice three hours. I don't play very well. You play yourself? I wish very much you'd play something for me. Papa has the idea that I should hear good music. Madame Merle has played for me several times. That's what I like best about Madame Merle. She has great facility. I shall never have facility. And I've no voice, just a small sound like the squeak of a slate pencil making flourishes. Isabel gratified this respectful wish, drew off her gloves and sat down to the piano, while Pansy, standing beside her, watched her white hands move quickly over the keys. When she stopped, she kissed the child good-bye, held her close, looked at her for long. "'Be very good,' she said. "'Give pleasure to your father.' "'I think that's what I live for,' Pansy answered. "'He has not much pleasure. He's rather a sad man.' Isabel listened to this assertion with an interest which he felt it almost a torment to be obliged to conceal. It was her pride that obliged her, and a certain sense of decency. There were still other things in her head which she felt a strong impulse, instantly checked, to say to Pansy about her father. There were things it would have given her pleasure to hear the child, to make the child say but she no sooner became conscious of these things than her imagination was hushed with horror at the idea of taking advantage of the little girl. It was of this she would have accused herself, and of exhaling into that air where he might still have a subtle sense for it any breath of her charmed state. She had come, she had come, but she had stayed only an hour. She rose quickly from the music-stool, even then, however, she lingered a moment, still holding her small companion, drawing the child's sweet slimness closer, and looking down at her almost in envy. She was obliged to confess it to herself. She would have taken a passionate pleasure in talking of Gilbert Osmond to this innocent, diminutive creature who was so near him. But she said no other word. She only kissed Pansy once again. They went together through the vestibule to the door that opened on the court, and there her young hostess stopped, looking rather wistfully beyond. "'I may go no further. I've promised Papa not to pass this door.' "'You're right to obey him. He'll never ask you anything unreasonable.' "'I shall always obey him. But when will you come again?' "'Not for a long time, I'm afraid.' "'As soon as you can, I hope.' I'm only a little girl, said Pansy, but I shall always expect you. And the small figure stood in the high dark doorway, watching Isabel cross the clear grey court and disappear into the brightness beyond the big portone, which gave a wider dazzle as it opened. End of chapter 30 Chapter 31 Isabel came back to Florence, but only after several months an interval sufficiently replete with incident. It is not, however, during this interval that we are closely concerned with her. Our attention is engaged again on a certain day in the late springtime, shortly after her return to Palazzo Crescentini, and a year from the date of the incidents just narrated. She was alone on this occasion in one of the smaller of the numerous rooms devoted by Mrs. Touchett to social uses and there was that in her expression and attitude which would have suggested that she was expecting a visitor. The tall window was open, and though its green shutters were partly drawn, the bright air of the garden had come in through a broad interstice, 
and filled the room with warmth and perfume. Our young woman stood near it for some time, her hands clasped behind her. She gazed abroad with the vagueness of unrest. Too troubled for attention, she moved in a vain circle. Yet it could not be in her thought to catch a glimpse of her visitor before he should pass into the house, since the entrance to the palace was not through the garden in which stillness and privacy always reigned. She wished rather to forestall his arrival by a process of conjecture, and to judge by the expression of her face this attempt gave her plenty to do. Grave she found herself, and positively more weighted as by the experience of the lapse of the year she had spent in seeing the world. She had ranged, she would have said, through space and surveyed much of mankind, and was therefore now, in her own eyes, a very different person from the frivolous young woman from Albany, who had begun to take the measure of Europe on the lawn at Garden Court a couple of years before. She flattered herself she had harvested wisdom, and learned a great deal more of life than this light-minded creature had ever suspected. If her thoughts just now had inclined themselves to retrospect, instead of fluttering their wings nervously about the present, they would have evoked a multitude of interesting pictures. These pictures would have been both landscapes and figure-pieces. The latter, however, would have been the more numerous. With several of the images that might have been projected on such a field, we are already acquainted. There would be, for instance, the conciliatory lily, our heroine's sister, and Edmund Ludlow's wife, who had come out from New York to spend five months with her relative. She had left her husband behind her, but had brought her children, to whom Isabel now played with equal munificence and tenderness the part of maiden aunt. Mr. Ludlow, toward the last, had been able to snatch a few weeks from his forensic triumphs, and crossing the ocean with extreme rapidity, had spent a month with the two ladies in Paris before taking his wife home. The little Ludlows had not yet, even from the American point of view, reached the proper tourist age, so that while her sister was with her, Isabel had confined her movements to a narrow circle. Lily and the babies had joined her in Switzerland in the month of July, and they had spent a summer of fine weather in an alpine valley, where the flowers were thick in the meadows, and the shade of great chestnuts made a resting place for such upward wanderings as might be undertaken by ladies and children on warm afternoons. They had afterwards reached the French capital, which was worshipped, and with costly ceremonies, by Lily, but thought of as noisily vacant by Isabel, who in these days made use of her memory of Rome as she might have done in a hot and crowded room of a file of something pungent hidden in her handkerchief. Mrs. Ludlow sacrificed, as I say, to Paris, yet had doubts and wonderments not allayed at that altar, and after her husband had joined her found further chagrin in his failure to throw himself into these speculations. They all had Isabel for subject, but Edmund Ludlow, as he always had done before, declined to be surprised or distressed or mystified or elated at anything his sister-in-law might have done or have failed to do. Mrs. Ludlow's mental motions were sufficiently various. At one moment she thought it would be so natural for that young woman to come home and take a house in New York the Rossiters, for instance, which had an elegant conservatory and was just round the corner from her own. At another she couldn't conceal her surprise at the girl's not marrying some member of one of the great aristocracies. On the whole, as I have said, she had fallen from high communion with the probabilities. She had taken more satisfaction in Isabel's accession of fortune than if the money had been left to herself. It had seemed to her to offer just the proper setting for her sister's slightly meagre but scarce the less eminent figure. Isabel had developed less, however, than Lily had thought likely, development to Lily's understanding being somewhat mysteriously connected with morning calls and evening parties. Intellectually, doubtless, she had made immense strides, 
but she appeared to have achieved few of those social conquests of which mrs ludlow had expected to admire the trophies lily's conception of such achievements was extremely vague but this was exactly what she had expected of isabel to give it form and body isabel could have done as well as she had done in new york and mrs ludlow appealed to her husband to know whether there was any privilege she enjoyed in europe which the society of that city might not offer her we know ourselves that isabel had made conquests whether inferior or not to those she might have effected in her native land it would be a delicate matter to decide and it is not altogether with a feeling of complacency that i again mention that she had not rendered these honourable victories public she had not told her sister the history of lord warburton nor had she given her a hint of mr osmond's state of mind and she had had no better reason for her silence than that she didn't wish to speak it was more romantic to say nothing and drinking deep in secret of romance she was as little disposed to ask poor lily's advice as she would have been to close that rare volume for ever but lily knew nothing of these discriminations and could only pronounce her sister's career a strange anti-climax an impression confirmed by the fact that isabel's silence about mr osmond for instance was in direct proportion to the frequency with which he occupied her thoughts as this happened very often it sometimes appeared to mrs ludlow that she had lost her courage so uncanny a result of so exhilarating an incident as inheriting a fortune was of course perplexing to the cheerful lily it added to her general sense that isabel was not at all like other people our young lady's courage however might have been taken as reaching its height after her relations had gone home she could imagine braver things than spending the winter in paris paris had sides by which it so resembled new york paris was like smart neat prose and her close correspondence with madame merle did much to stimulate such flights she had never had a keener sense of freedom of the absolute boldness and wantonness of liberty than when she turned away from the platform at the euston station on one of the last days of november after the departure of the train that was to convey poor lily her husband and her children to their ship at liverpool it had been good for her to regale she was very conscious of that she was very observant as we know of what was good for her and her effort was constantly to find something that was good enough to profit by the present advantage till the latest moment she had made the journey from paris with the unenvied travellers she would have accompanied them to liverpool as well only edmund ludlow had asked her as a favour not to do so it made lily so fidgety and she asked such impossible questions isabel watched the train move away she kissed her hand to the elder of her small nephews a demonstrative child who leaned dangerously far out of the window of the carriage and made separation an occasion of violent hilarity and then she walked back into the foggy london street the world lay before her she could do whatever she chose there was a deep thrill in it all but for the present her choice was tolerably discreet she chose simply to walk back from euston square to her hotel the early dusk of a november afternoon had already closed in the street lamps in the thick brown air looked weak and red our heroine was unattended and euston square was a long way from piccadilly but isabel performed the journey with a positive enjoyment of its dangers and lost her way almost on purpose in order to get more sensations so that she was disappointed when an obliging policeman easily set her right again she was so fond of the spectacle of human life that she enjoyed even the aspect of gathering dusk in the london streets the moving crowds the hurrying cabs the lighted shops the flaring stalls the dark shining dampness of everything that evening at her hotel she wrote to madame merle that she should start in a day or two for rome she made her way down to rome without touching at florence having gone first to venice and then proceeded southward by ancona she accomplished this journey without other assistance than that of her servant 
for her natural protectors were not now on the ground. Ralph Touchett was spending the winter at Corfu, and Miss Stackpole, in the September previous, had been recalled to America by a telegram from the interviewer. This journal offered its brilliant correspondent a fresher field for her genius than the mouldering cities of Europe, and Henrietta was cheered on her way by a promise from Mr. Bantling that he would soon come over to see her. Isabel wrote to Mrs. Touchett to apologize for not presenting herself just yet in Florence, and her aunt replied characteristically enough. Apologies, Mrs. Touchett intimated, were of no more use to her than bubbles, and she herself never dealt in such articles. One either did the thing or one didn't, and what one would have done belonged to the sphere of the irrelevant, like the idea of a future life or the origin of things. Her letter was frank, but, a rare case with Mrs. Touchett, not so frank as it pretended. She easily forgave her niece for not stopping at Florence, because she took it for a sign that Gilbert Osmond was less in question there than formerly. She watched, of course, to see if he would now find a pretext for going to Rome, and derived some comfort from learning that he had not been guilty of an absence. Isabel, on her side, had not been a fortnight in Rome before she proposed to Madame Merle that they should make a little pilgrimage to the east. Madame Merle remarked that her friend was restless, but she added that she herself had always been consumed with the desire to visit Athens and Constantinople. The two ladies accordingly embarked on this expedition, and spent three months in Greece, in Turkey, in Egypt. Isabel found much to interest her in these countries, though Madame Merle continued to remark that even among the most classic sites, the scenes most calculated to suggest repose and reflection, a certain incoherence prevailed in her. Isabel travelled rapidly and recklessly, she was like a thirsty person draining cup after cup. Madame Merle, meanwhile, as lady-in-waiting to a princess circulating incognita, panted a little in her rear. It was on Isabel's invitation she had come, and she imparted all due dignity to the girl's uncountenanced state. She played her part with the tact that might have been expected of her effacing herself and accepting the position of a companion whose expenses were profusely paid. The situation, however, had no hardships, and people who met this reserved though striking pair on their travels would not have been able to tell you which was patroness and which client. To say that Madame Merle improved on acquaintance states meagerly the impression she made on her friend, who had found her from the first so ample and so easy. At the end of an intimacy of three months, Isabel felt she knew her better, her character had revealed itself, and the admirable woman had also at last redeemed her promise of relating her history from her own point of view, a consummation the more desirable, as Isabel had already heard it related from the point of view of others. This history was so sad a one, in so far as it concerned the late Monsieur Merle, a positive adventurer, she might say, though originally so plausible, who had taken advantage years before of her youth and of an inexperience in which doubtless those who knew her only now would find it difficult to believe. It abounded so in startling and lamentable incidents that her companion wondered a person so éprouvé could have kept so much of her freshness, her interest in life. Into this freshness of Madame Merle's she obtained a considerable insight. She seemed to see it as professional, as slightly mechanical, carried about in its case like the fiddle of the virtuoso, or blanketed and bridled like the favourite of the jockey. She liked her as much as ever, but there was a corner of the curtain that never was lifted. It was as if she had remained, after all, something of a public performer, condemned to emerge only in character and in costume. She had once said that she came from a distance, that she belonged to the old, old world, and Isabel never lost the impression that she was the product of a different moral or social clime from her own, that she had grown up under other stars. She believed then that at bottom she had a different morality. Of course the morality of civilized persons has always much in common, 
but our young woman had a sense in her of values gone wrong or as they said at the shops marked down she considered with the presumption of youth that a morality differing from her own must be inferior to it and this conviction was an aid to detecting an occasional flash of cruelty an occasional lapse from candour in the conversation of a person who had raised delicate kindness to an art and whose pride was too high for the narrow ways of deception her conception of human motives might in certain lights have been acquired at the court of some kingdom in decadence and there were several in her list of which our heroine had not even heard she had not heard of everything that was very plain and there were evidently things in the world of which it was not advantageous to hear she had once or twice had a positive scare since it so affected her to have to exclaim of her friend heaven forgive her she doesn't understand me absurd as it may seem this discovery operated as a shock left her with a vague dismay in which there was even an element of foreboding the dismay of course subsided in the light of some sudden proof of madame merle's remarkable intelligence but it stood for a high water mark in the ebb and flow of confidence madame merle had once declared her belief that when a friendship ceases to grow it immediately begins to decline there being no point of equilibrium between liking more and liking less a stationary affection in other words was impossible it must move one way or the other however that may be the girl had in these days a thousand uses for her sense of the romantic which was more active than it had ever been i do not allude to the impulse it received as she gazed at the pyramids in the course of an excursion from cairo or as she stood among the broken columns of the acropolis and fixed her eyes upon the point designated to her as the strait of salamis deep and memorable as these emotions had remained she came back by the last of march from egypt and greece and made another stay in rome a few days after her arrival gilbert osmond descended from florence and remained three weeks during which the fact of her being with his old friend madame merle in whose house she had gone to lodge made it virtually inevitable that he should see her every day when the last of april came she wrote to mrs touchett that she should now rejoice to accept an invitation given long before and went to pay a visit at palazzo crescentini madame merle on this occasion remaining in rome she found her aunt alone her cousin was still at corfu ralph however was expected in florence from day to day and isabel who had not seen him for upwards of a year was prepared to give him the most affectionate welcome End of chapter thirty one Chapters thirty two and thirty three of Portrait of a Lady by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty two. It was not of him, nevertheless, that she was thinking while she stood at the window near which we found her a while ago, and it was not of any of the matters I have rapidly sketched. She was not turned to the past, but to the immediate impending hour she had reason to expect a scene and she was not fond of scenes she was not asking herself what she should say to her visitor this question had already been answered what he would say to her that was the interesting issue it could be nothing in the least soothing she had warrant for this and the conviction doubtless showed in the cloud on her brow for the rest however all clearness reigned in her she had put away her mourning and she walked in no small shimmering splendour she only felt older ever so much and as if she were worth more for it like some curious piece in an antiquary's collection she was not at any rate left indefinitely to her apprehensions for a servant at last stood before her with a card on his tray let the gentleman come in she said and continued to gaze out of the window after the footman had retired it was only when she had heard the door close behind the person who presently entered that she looked round caspar goodwood stood there 
stood and received a moment from head to foot the bright dry gaze with which she rather withheld than offered a greeting whether his sense of maturity had kept pace with isabel's we shall perhaps presently ascertain let me say meanwhile that to her critical glance he showed nothing of the injury of time straight strong and hard there was nothing in his appearance that spoke positively either of youth or of age if he had neither innocence nor weakness so he had no practical philosophy his jaw showed the same voluntary cast as in earlier days but a crisis like the present had in it of course something grim he had the air of a man who had travelled hard he said nothing at first as if he had been out of breath this gave isabel time to make a reflection poor fellow what great things he's capable of and what a pity he should waste so dreadfully his splendid force what a pity too that one can't satisfy everybody it gave her time to do more to say at the end of a minute i can't tell you how i hoped you wouldn't come i've no doubt of that and he looked about him for a seat not only had he come but he meant to settle you must be very tired said isabel seating herself and generously as she thought to give him his opportunity no i'm not at all tired did you ever know me to be tired never i wish i had when did you arrive last night very late in a kind of snail train they call the express these italian trains go at about the rate of an american funeral that's in keeping you must have felt as if you were coming to bury me and she forced a smile of encouragement to an easy view of their situation she had reasoned the matter well out making it perfectly clear that she broke no faith and falsified no contract but for all this she was afraid of her visitor she was ashamed of her fear but she was devoutly thankful there was nothing else to be ashamed of he looked at her with his stiff insistence an insistence in which there was such a want of tact especially when the dull dark beam in his eye rested on her as a physical weight no i didn't feel that i couldn't think of you as dead i wish i could he candidly declared i thank you immensely i'd rather think of you as dead than married to another man that's very selfish of you she returned with the ardour of a real conviction if you're not happy yourself others have yet a right to be very likely it's selfish but i don't in the least mind your saying so i don't mind anything you can say now i don't feel it the cruelest things you could think of would be mere pinpricks after what you've done i shall never feel anything i mean anything but that that i shall feel all my life mr goodwood made these detached assertions with a dry deliberateness in his hard slow american tone which flung no atmospheric colour over propositions intrinsically crude the tone made isabel angry rather than touched her but her anger perhaps was fortunate inasmuch as it gave her a further reason for controlling herself it was under the pressure of this control that she became after a little while irrelevant when did you leave new york he threw up his head as if calculating seventeen days ago you must have travelled fast in spite of your slow trains i came as fast as i could i'd have come five days ago if i'd been able it wouldn't have made any difference mr goodwood she coldly smiled not to you no but to me you gain nothing that i see that's for me to judge of course to me it seems that you only torment yourself and then to change the subject she asked him if he had seen henrietta stackpole he looked as if he had not come from boston to florence to talk of henrietta stackpole but he answered distinctly enough that this young lady had been with him just before he left america she came to see you isabel then demanded yes she was in boston and she called at my office it was the day i had got your letter did you tell her isabel asked with a certain anxiety 
oh no said caspar goodwood simply i didn't want to do that she'll hear it quick enough she hears everything i shall write to her and then she'll write to me and scold me isabel declared trying to smile again caspar however remained sternly grave i guess she'll come right out he said on purpose to scold me i don't know she seemed to think that she had not seen europe thoroughly i'm glad you tell me that isabel said i must prepare for her mr goodwood fixed his eyes for a moment on the floor then at last raising them does she know mr osmond he inquired a little and she doesn't like him but of course i don't marry to please henrietta she added it would have been better for poor caspar if she had tried a little more to gratify miss stackpole but he didn't say so he only asked presently when her marriage would take place to which she made answer that she didn't know yet i can only say it will be soon i've told no one but yourself and one other person an old friend of mr osmond's is it a marriage your friends won't like he demanded i really haven't an idea as i say i don't marry for my friends he went on making no exclamation no comment only asking questions doing it quite without delicacy who and what then is mr gilbert osmond who and what nobody and nothing but a very good and very honourable man he's not in business said isabel he's not rich he's not known for anything in particular she disliked mr goodwood's questions but she said to herself that she owed it to him to satisfy him as far as possible the satisfaction poor caspar exhibited was however small he sat very upright gazing at her where does he come from where does he belong she had never been so little pleased with the way he said belong he comes from nowhere he has spent most of his life in italy you said in your letter he was american hasn't he a native place yes but he has forgotten it he left it as a small boy has he never gone back why should he go back isabel asked flushing all defensively he has no profession he might have gone back for his pleasure doesn't he like the united states he doesn't know them then he's very quiet and very simple he contents himself with italy with italy and with you said mr goodwood with gloomy plainness and no appearance of trying to make an epigram what has he ever done he asked abruptly that i should marry him nothing at all isabel replied while her patience helped itself by turning a little to hardness if he had done great things would you forgive me any better give me up mr goodwood i'm marrying a perfect nonentity don't try to take an interest in him you can't i can't appreciate him that's what you mean and you don't mean in the least that he's a perfect nonentity you think he's grand you think he's great though no one else thinks so isabel's colour deepened she felt this really acute of her companion and it was certainly a proof of the aid that passion might render perceptions she had never taken for fine why do you always come back to what others think i can't discuss mr osmond with you of course not said caspar reasonably and he sat there with his air of stiff helplessness as if not only this were true but there were nothing else that they might discuss you see how little you gain she accordingly broke out how little comfort or satisfaction i can give you i didn't expect you to give me much i don't understand then why you came i came because i wanted to see you once more even just as you are i appreciate that but if you had waited a while sooner or later we should have been sure to meet and our meeting would have been pleasanter for each of us than this waited till after you're married that's just what i didn't want to do you'll be different then not very i shall still be a great friend of yours you'll see that will make it all the worse said mr goodwood grimly 
ah you're unaccommodating i can't promise to dislike you in order to help you to resign yourself i shouldn't care if you did isabel got up with a movement of repressed impatience and walked to the window where she remained a moment looking out when she turned round her visitor was still motionless in his place she came toward him again and stopped resting her hand on the back of the chair she had just quitted do you mean you simply came to look at me that's better for you perhaps than for me i wish to hear the sound of your voice he said you've heard it and you see it says nothing very sweet it gives me pleasure all the same and with this he got up she had felt pain and displeasure on receiving early that day the news he was in florence and by her leave would come within an hour to see her she had been vexed and distressed though she had sent back word by his messenger that he might come when he would she had not been better pleased when she saw him his being there at all was so full of heavy implications it implied things she could never assent to rights reproaches remonstrance rebuke the expectation of making her change her purpose these things however if implied had not been expressed and now our young lady strangely enough began to resent her visitor's remarkable self-control there was a dumb misery about him that irritated her there was a manly staying of his hand that made her heart beat faster she felt her agitation rising and she said to herself that she was angry in the way a woman is angry when she has been in the wrong she was not in the wrong she had fortunately not that bitterness to swallow but all the same she wished he would denounce her a little she had wished his visit would be short it had no purpose no propriety yet now that he seemed to be turning away she felt a sudden horror of his leaving her without uttering a word that would give her an opportunity to defend herself more than she had done in writing to him a month before in a few carefully chosen words to announce her engagement if she were not in the wrong however why should she desire to defend herself it was an excess of generosity on isabel's part the desire that mr goodwood should be angry and if he had not meanwhile held himself hard it might have made him so to hear the tone in which she suddenly exclaimed as if she were accusing him of having accused her i've not deceived you i was perfectly free yes i know that said caspar i gave you full warning that i do as i chose you said you'd probably never marry and you said it with such a manner that i pretty well believed it she considered this an instant no one can be more surprised than myself at my present intention you told me that if i heard you were engaged i was not to believe it caspar went on i heard it twenty days ago from yourself but i remembered what you had said i thought there might be some mistake and that's partly why i came if you wish me to repeat it by word of mouth that's soon done there's no mistake whatever i saw that as soon as i came into the room what good would it do you that i shouldn't marry she asked with a certain fierceness i should like it better than this you're very selfish as i said before i know that i'm selfish as iron even iron sometimes melts if you'll be reasonable i'll see you again don't you call me reasonable now i don't know what to say to you she answered with sudden humility i shan't trouble you for a long time the young man went on he made a step towards the door but he stopped another reason why i came was that i wanted to hear what you would say in explanation of your having changed your mind her humbleness as suddenly deserted her in explanation do you think i'm bound to explain he gave her one of his long dumb looks you were very positive i did believe it so did i do you think i could explain if i would no i suppose not well he added i've done what i wished i've seen you 
how little you make of these terrible journeys she felt the poverty of her presently replying if you're afraid i'm knocked up in any such way as that you may be at your ease about it he turned away this time in earnest and no handshake no sign of parting was exchanged between them at the door he stopped with his hand on the knob i shall leave florence to-morrow he said without a quaver i'm delighted to hear it she answered passionately five minutes after he had gone she burst into tears end of chapter thirty two chapter thirty three her fit of weeping however was soon smothered and the signs of it had vanished when an hour later she broke the news to her aunt i use this expression because she had been sure mrs touchett would not be pleased isabel had only waited to tell her till she had seen mr goodwood she had an odd impression that it would not be honourable to make the fact public before she should have heard what mr goodwood would say about it he had said rather less than she expected and she now had a somewhat angry sense of having lost time but she would lose no more she waited till mrs touchett came into the drawing-room before the midday breakfast and then she began aunt lydia i've something to tell you mrs touchett gave a little jump and looked at her almost fiercely you needn't tell me i know what it is i don't know how you know the same way that i know when the windows open by feeling a draught you're going to marry that man what man do you mean isabel inquired with great dignity madame merle's friend mr osmond i don't know why you call him madame merle's friend is that the principal thing he's known by if he's not her friend he ought to be after what she has done for him cried mrs touchett i shouldn't have expected it of her i'm disappointed if you mean that madame merle has had anything to do with my engagement you're greatly mistaken isabel declared with a sort of ardent coldness you mean that your attractions were sufficient without the gentleman's having had to be lashed up you're quite right they're immense your attractions and he would never have presumed to think of you if she hadn't put him up to it he has a very good opinion of himself but he was not a man to take trouble madame merle took the trouble for him he has taken a great deal for himself cried isabel with a voluntary laugh mrs touchett gave a sharp nod i think he must after all to have made you like him so much i thought he even pleased you he did at one time and that's why i'm angry with him be angry with me not with him said the girl oh i'm always angry with you that's no satisfaction was it for this that you refused lord warburton please don't go back to that why shouldn't i like mr osmond since others have done so others at their wildest moments never wanted to marry him there's nothing of him mrs touchett explained that he can't hurt me said isabel do you think you're going to be happy no one's happy in such doings you should know i shall set the fashion then what does one marry for what you will marry for heaven only knows people usually marry as they go into partnership to set up a house but in your partnership you'll bring everything is it that mr osmond isn't rich is that what you're talking about isabel asked he has no money he has no name he has no importance i value such things and i have the courage to say it i think they're very precious many other people think the same and they show it but they give some other reason isabel hesitated a little i think i value everything that's valuable i care very much for money and that's why i wish mr osmond to have a little give it to him then but marry someone else his name's good enough for me the girl went on it's a very pretty name have i such a fine one myself all the more reason you should improve on it there are only a dozen american names do you marry him out of charity it was my duty to tell you aunt lydia but i don't think it's my duty to explain to you 
even if it were i shouldn't be able so please don't remonstrate in talking about it you have me at a disadvantage i can't talk about it i don't remonstrate i simply answer you i must give some sign of intelligence i saw it coming and i said nothing i never meddle you never do and i'm greatly obliged to you you've been very considerate it was not considerate it was convenient said mrs touchett but i shall talk to madame merle i don't see why you keep bringing her in she has been a very good friend to me possibly but she has been a poor one to me what has she done to you she has deceived me she had as good as promised me to prevent your engagement she couldn't have prevented it she can do anything that's what i've always liked her for i knew she could play any part but i understood that she played them one by one i didn't understand that she would play two at the same time i don't know what part she may have played to you isabel said that's between yourselves to me she has been honest and kind and devoted devoted of course she wished you to marry her candidate she told me she was watching you only in order to interpose she said that to please you the girl answered conscious however of the inadequacy of the explanation to please me by deceiving me she knows me better am i pleased to-day i don't think you're ever much pleased isabel was obliged to reply if madame Merle knew you would learn the truth what had she to gain by insincerity she gained time as you see while i waited for her to interfere you were marching away and she was really beating the drum that's very well but by your own admission you saw i was marching and even if she had given the alarm you wouldn't have tried to stop me no but someone else would whom do you mean isabel asked looking very hard at her aunt mrs touchett's little bright eyes active as they usually were sustained her gaze rather than returned it would you have listened to ralph not if he had abused mr osmond ralph doesn't abuse people you know that perfectly he cares very much for you i know he does said isabel and i shall feel the value of it now for he knows that whatever i do i do with reason he never believed you would do this i told him you were capable of it and he argued the other way he did it for the sake of argument the girl smiled you don't accuse him of having deceived you why should you accuse madame merle he never pretended he'd prevent it i'm glad of that cried isabel gaily i wish very much she presently added that when he comes you tell him first of my engagement of course i shall mention it said mrs touchett i shall say nothing more to you about it but i give you notice that i shall talk to others that's as you please i only meant that it's rather better the announcement should come from you than from me i quite agree with you it's much more proper and on this the aunt and the niece went to breakfast where mrs touchett as good as her word made no allusion to gilbert osmond after an interval of silence however she asked a companion from whom she had received a visit an hour before from an old friend an american gentleman isabel said with colour in her cheek an american gentleman of course it's only an american gentleman who calls at ten o'clock in the morning it was half-past ten he was in a great hurry he goes away this evening couldn't he have come yesterday at the usual time he only arrived last night he spends but twenty-four hours in florence mrs touchett cried he's an american gentleman truly he is indeed said isabel thinking with perverse admiration of what caspar goodwood had done for her two days afterward ralph arrived but though isabel was sure that mrs touchett had lost no time in imparting to him the great fact he showed at first no open knowledge of it their prompted talk was naturally of his health isabel had many questions to ask about corfu she had been shocked by his appearance when he came into the room 
she had forgotten how ill he looked in spite of corfu he looked very ill to-day and she wondered if he were really worse or if she were simply disaccustomed to living with an invalid poor ralph made no nearer approach to conventional beauty as he advanced in life and the now apparently complete loss of his health had done little to mitigate the natural oddity of his person blighted and battered but still responsive and still ironic his face was like a lighted lantern patched with paper and unsteadily held his thin whisker languished upon a lean cheek the exorbitant curve of his nose defined itself more sharply lean he was altogether lean and long and loose-jointed an accidental cohesion of relaxed angles his brown velvet jacket had become perennial his hands had fixed themselves in his pockets he shambled and stumbled and shuffled in a manner that denoted great physical helplessness it was perhaps this whimsical gait that helped to mark his character more than ever as that of the humorous invalid the invalid for whom even his own disabilities are part of the general joke they might well indeed with ralph have been the chief cause of the want of seriousness marking his view of a world in which the reason for his own continued presence was past finding out isabel had grown fond of his ugliness his awkwardness had become dear to her they had been sweetened by association they struck her as the very terms on which it had been given him to be charming he was so charming that her sense of his being ill had hitherto had a sort of comfort in it the state of his health had seemed not a limitation but a kind of intellectual advantage it absolved him from all professional and official emotions and left him the luxury of being exclusively personal the personality so resulting was delightful he had remained proof against the staleness of disease he had had to consent to be deplorably ill yet had somehow escaped to being formally sick such had been the girl's impression of her cousin and when she had pitied him it was only on reflection as she reflected a good deal she had allowed him a certain amount of compassion but she always had a dread of wasting that essence a precious article worth more to the giver than to any one else now however it took no great sensibility to feel that poor ralph's tenure of life was less elastic than it should be he was a bright free generous spirit he had all the illumination of wisdom and none of its pedantry and yet he was distressfully dying isabel noted afresh that life was certainly hard for some people and she felt a delicate glow of shame as she thought how easy it now promised to become for herself she was prepared to learn that ralph was not pleased with her engagement but she was not prepared in spite of her affection for him to let this fact spoil the situation she was not even prepared or so she thought to resent his want of sympathy for it would be his privilege it would be indeed his natural line to find fault with any step she might take toward marriage one's cousin always pretended to hate one's husband that was traditional classical it was a part of one's cousin's always pretending to adore one ralph was nothing if not critical and though she would certainly other things being equal have been as glad to marry to please him as to please any one it would be absurd to regard as important that her choice should square with his views what were his views after all he had pretended to believe that she had better have married lord warburton but this was only because he had refused that excellent man if she had accepted him ralph would certainly have taken another tone he always took the opposite you could criticize any marriage it was the essence of a marriage to be open to criticism how well she herself should she only give her mind to it might criticize this union of her own she had other employment however and ralph was welcome to relieve her of the care isabel was prepared to be most patient and most indulgent he must have seen that and this made it the more odd that he should say nothing after three days had elapsed without his speaking our young woman wearied of waiting 
Dislike it as he would, he might at least go through the form. We, who know more about poor Ralph than his cousin, may easily believe that during the hours that followed his arrival at Palazzo Crescentini, he had privately gone through many forms. His mother had literally greeted him with the great news which had been even more sensibly chilling than Mrs. Touchett's maternal kiss. Ralph was shocked and humiliated. His calculations had been false, and the person in the world in whom he was most interested was lost. He drifted about the house like a rudderless vessel in a rocky stream, or sat in the garden of the palace on a great cane chair, his long legs extended, his head thrown back, and his hat pulled over his eyes. He felt cold about the heart. He had never liked anything less. What could he do? What could he say? If the girl were irreclaimable, could he pretend to like it? To attempt to reclaim her was permissible only if the attempt should succeed. To try to persuade her of anything sordid or sinister in the man to whose deep art she had succumbed would be decently discreet only in the event of her being persuaded. Otherwise he should simply have damned himself. It cost him an equal effort to speak his thought and to dissemble. He could neither assent with sincerity nor protest with hope. Meanwhile he knew, or rather he supposed, that the affianced pair were daily renewing their mutual vows. Osmond at this moment showed himself little at Palazzo Crescentini, but Isabel met him every day elsewhere, as she was free to do after their engagement had been made public. She had taken a carriage by the month, so as not to be indebted to her aunt for the means of pursuing a course which Mrs. Touchett disapproved, and she drove in the morning to the Cascine. This suburban wilderness during the early hours was void of all intruders, and our young lady, joined by her lover in its quietest part, strolled with him a while through the grey Italian shade and listened to the nightingales. End of chapter 33「Chapters 34 and 35 of the Portrait of a Lady by Henry James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 34 One morning, on her return from her drive, some half hour before luncheon, she quitted her vehicle in the court of the palace, and instead of ascending the great staircase, crossed the court, passed beneath another archway, and entered the garden. A sweeter spot at this moment could not have been imagined. The stillness of noontide hung over it, and the warm shade, enclosed and still, made bowers like spacious caves. Ralph was sitting there in the clear gloom, at the base of a statue of Terpsichore, a dancing nymph with taper fingers and inflated draperies in the manner of Bernini. The extreme relaxation of his attitude suggested at first to Isabel that he was asleep. Her light footstep on the grass had not roused him, and before turning away she stood for a moment looking at him. During this instant he opened his eyes, upon which she sat down on a rustic chair that matched with his own. Though in her irritation she had accused him of indifference, she was not blind to the fact that he had visibly had something to brood over but she had explained his air of absence partly by the languor of his increased weakness, partly by worries connected with the property inherited from his father, the fruit of eccentric arrangements of which Mrs. Touchett disapproved, and which, as she had told Isabel, now encountered opposition from the other partners in the bank. He ought to have gone to England, his mother said, instead of coming to Florence, he had not been there for months and took no more interest in the bank than in the state of Patagonia. "'I'm sorry I waked you,' Isabel said. "'You look too tired.' "'I feel too tired. But I was not asleep. I was thinking of you.' "'Are you tired of that?' "'Very much so. It leads to nothing. The road's long and I never arrive.' "'What do you wish to arrive at?' she put to him closing her parasol. 
at the point of expressing to myself properly what I think of your engagement. Don't think too much of it, she lightly returned. Do you mean that it's none of my business? Beyond a certain point, yes. That's the point I want to fix. I had an idea you may have found me wanting in good manners. I've never congratulated you. Of course I've noticed that. I wondered why you were silent. There have been a good many reasons. I'll tell you now, Ralph said. He pulled off his hat and laid it on the ground. Then he sat looking at her. He leaned back under the protection of Bernini, his head against his marble pedestal, his arms dropped on either side of him, his hands laid upon the rests of his wide chair. He looked awkward, uncomfortable. He hesitated too long. Isabel said nothing. When people were embarrassed, she was usually sorry for them, but she was determined not to help Ralph to utter a word that should not be to the honour of her high decision. "'I think I've hardly got over my surprise,' he went on at last. "'You were the last person I expected to see caught.' "'I don't know why you call it caught.' "'Because you're going to be put into a cage.' "'If I like my cage, that needn't trouble you,' she answered. "'That's what I wonder at. That's what I've been thinking of. "'If you've been thinking, you may imagine how I've thought. "'I'm satisfied that I'm doing well.' You must have changed immensely. A year ago you valued your liberty beyond everything. You wanted only to see life. I've seen it, said Isabel. It doesn't look to me now, I admit, such an inviting expanse. I don't pretend it is. Only I had an idea that you took a genial view of it and wanted to survey the whole field. I've seen that one can't do anything so general. One must choose a corner and cultivate that. That's what I think. And one must choose as good a corner as possible. I had no idea all winter, while I read your delightful letters, that you were choosing. You said nothing about it, and your silence put me off my guard. It was not a matter I was likely to write to you about. Besides, I knew nothing of the future. It has all come lately. If you had been on your guard, however, Isabel asked, what would you have done? I should have said, wait a little longer. Wait for what? Well, for a little more light, said Ralph, with rather an absurd smile, while his hands found their way into his pockets. Where should my light have come from? From you? I might have struck a spark or two. Isabel had drawn off her gloves. She smoothed them out as they lay upon her knee. The mildness of this movement was accidental, for her expression was not conciliatory. You're beating about the bush, Ralph. You wish to say you don't like Mr. Osmond, and yet you're afraid. Willing to wound and yet afraid to strike? I'm willing to wound him, yes, but not to wound you. I'm afraid of you, not of him. If you marry him, it won't be a fortunate way for me to have spoken. If I marry him? Have you any expectation of dissuading me? Of course that seems to you too fatuous. No, said Isabel, after a little. It seems to me too touching. That's the same thing. It makes me so ridiculous that you pity me. She stroked out her long gloves again. I know you have a great affection for me. I can't get rid of that. For heaven's sake, don't try. Keep that well in sight. It will convince you how intensely I want you to do well. And how little you trust me. There was a moment's silence. The warm noontide seemed to listen. I trust you, but I don't trust him, said Ralph. She raised her eyes and gave him a wide, deep look. You've said it now, and I'm glad you've made it so clear. But you'll suffer by it. Not if you're just. I'm very just, said Isabel. What better proof of it can there be than that I'm not angry with you? I don't know what's the matter with me, but I'm not. I was when you began, but it has passed away. Perhaps I ought to be angry, but Mr. Osmond wouldn't think so. 
He wants me to know everything. That's what I like him for. You've nothing to gain, I know that. I've never been so nice to you, as a girl, that you should have much reason for wishing me to remain one. You give me very good advice. You've often done so. No, I'm very quiet. I've always believed in your wisdom, she went on, boasting of her quietness, yet speaking with a kind of contained exaltation. It was her passionate desire to be just. It touched Ralph to the heart, affected him like a caress from a creature he had injured. He wished to interrupt, to reassure her. For a moment he was absurdly inconsistent. He would have retracted what he had said. But she gave him no chance. She went on, having caught a glimpse, as she thought, of the heroic line, and desiring to advance in that direction. "'I see you some special idea. I should like very much to hear it. I'm sure it's disinterested. I feel that. It seems a strange thing to argue about, and of course I ought to tell you definitely that if you expect to dissuade me you may give it up. You'll not move me an inch. It's too late.' As you say, I'm caught. Certainly it won't be pleasant for you to remember this, but your pain will be in your own thoughts. I shall never reproach you. I don't think you ever will, said Ralph. It's not at the least the sort of marriage I thought you'd make. What sort of marriage was that, pray? Well, I can hardly say. I hadn't exactly a positive view of it, but I had a negative. I didn't think you'd decide for, well, for that type. What's the matter with Mr. Osmond's type, if it be one? His being so independent, so individual, is what I most see in him, the girl declared. What do you know against him? You know him scarcely at all. Yes, Ralph said. I know him very little, and I confess I haven't facts and items to prove him a villain but all the same I can't help feeling that you're running a grave risk. Marriage is always a grave risk, and his risk's as grave as mine. That's his affair. If he's afraid, let him back out. I wish to God he would. Isabel reclined in her chair, folding her arms, and gazing a while at her cousin. I don't think I understand you, she said at last, coldly. I don't know what you're talking about. I believed you'd marry a man of more importance. Cold, I say, her tone had been. But at this a color like a flame leaped into her face. Of more importance to whom? It seems to me enough that one's husband should be of importance to oneself. Ralph blushed as well. His attitude embarrassed him. Physically speaking, he proceeded to change it. He straightened himself, then leaned forward, resting a hand on each knee. He fixed his eyes on the ground. He had an air of the most respectful deliberation. "'I'll tell you in a moment what I mean,' he presently said. He felt agitated, intensely eager. Now that he had opened the discussion, he wished to discharge his mind. But he wished also to be superlatively gentle. Isabel waited a little. Then she went on with majesty. In everything that makes one care for people, Mr. Osmond is pre-eminent. There may be nobler natures, but I've never had the pleasure of meeting one. Mr. Osmond's is the finest I know. He's good enough for me, and interesting enough, and clever enough. I'm far more struck with what he has and what he represents than with what he may lack. I had treated myself to a charming vision of your future, Ralph observed without answering this. I had amused myself with planning out a high destiny for you. There was to be nothing of this sort in it. You were not to come down so easily or so soon. Come down, you say? Well, that renders my sense of what has happened to you. You seem to me to be soaring far up in the blue to be sailing in the bright light over the heads of men. Suddenly someone tosses up a faded rosebud, a missile that should never have reached you, and straight you drop to the ground. It hurts me, said Ralph audaciously, hurts me as if I had fallen myself. The look of pain and bewilderment deepened in his companion's face. 
"'I don't understand you in the least,' she repeated. "'You say you amused yourself with a project for my career. "'I don't understand that. "'Don't amuse yourself too much, "'or I shall think you're doing it at my expense.' "'Ralph shook his head. "'I'm not afraid of your not believing "'that I've had great ideas for you.' "'What do you mean by my soaring and sailing?' she pursued. "'I've never moved on a higher plane than I'm moving on now. "'There's nothing higher for a girl than to marry a—a a person she likes,' said poor Isabel, wandering into the didactic. "'It's your liking the person we speak of that I venture to criticise, my dear cousin. "'I should have said that the man for you would have been a more active, larger, freer sort of nature.' Ralph hesitated, then added, "'I can't get over the sense that Osmond is somehow, well, small.' He had uttered the last word with no great assurance. He was afraid she would flash out again. But to his surprise she was quiet. She had the air of considering. "'Small?' She made it sound immense. "'I think he's narrow, selfish. He takes himself so seriously.' "'He has a great respect for himself. "'I don't blame him for that,' said Isabel. "'It makes one more sure to respect others.' "'Ralph, for a moment, felt almost reassured "'by her reasonable tone. "'Yes, but everything is relative. "'One ought to feel one's relation to things, to others. "'I don't think Mr. Osmond does that. "'I've chiefly to do with his relation to me. "'In that he's excellent.' "'He's the incarnation of taste,' Ralph went on, thinking hard how he could best express Gilbert Osmond's sinister attributes without putting himself in the wrong by seeming to describe him coarsely. He wished to describe him impersonally, scientifically. He judges and measures, approves and condemns, altogether by that. "'It's a happy thing, then, that his taste should be so exquisite.' "'It's exquisite indeed, since it has led him to select you as his bride. "'But have you ever seen such a taste, a really exquisite one, ruffled?' "'I hope it may never be my fortune to fail to gratify my husband's.' "'At these words a sudden passion leaped to Ralph's lips. "'Ah, that's willful, that's unworthy of you. "'You were not meant to be measured in that way.' You were meant for something better than to keep guard over the sensibilities of a sterile dilettante. Isabel rose quickly, and he did the same, so that they stood for a moment looking at each other as if he had flung down a defiance or an insult. But you go too far, she simply breathed. I've said what I had on my mind, and I've said it because I love you. Isabel turned pale. Was he, too, on that tiresome list? She had a sudden wish to strike him off. Ah, then you're not disinterested. I love you, but I love without hope, said Ralph quickly, forcing a smile, and feeling that in that last declaration he had expressed more than he intended. Isabel moved away and stood looking into the sunny stillness of the garden, but after a little she turned back to him. I'm afraid your talk, then, is the wildness of despair. I don't understand it, but it doesn't matter. I'm not arguing with you. It's impossible I should. I've only tried to listen to you. I'm much obliged to you for attempting to explain, she said gently, as if the anger with which she had just sprung up had already subsided. It's very good of you to try to warn me, if you're really alarmed, but I won't promise to think of what you've said. I shall forget it as soon as possible. Try and forget it yourself. You've done your duty, and no man can do more. I can't explain to you what I feel, what I believe, and I wouldn't if I could. She paused a moment, and then went on with an inconsequence that Ralph observed even in the midst of his eagerness to discover some symptom of concession. I can't enter into your idea of Mr. Osmond, I can't do it justice, because I see him in quite another way. He's not important. No, he's not important. He's a man to whom importance is supremely indifferent. If that's what you mean when you call him small, 
then he's as small as you please i call that large it's the largest thing i know i won't pretend to argue with you about a person i'm going to marry isabel repeated i'm not in the least concerned to defend mr osmond he's not so weak as to need my defence i should think it would seem strange even to yourself that i should talk of him so quietly and coldly as if he were any one else i wouldn't talk of him at all to any one but you and you after what you've said i may just answer you once for all pray would you wish me to make a mercenary marriage what they call a marriage of ambition i've only one ambition to be free to follow out a good feeling i had others once but they've passed away do you complain of mr osmond because he's not rich that's just what i like him for i've fortunately money enough i've never felt so thankful for it as to-day there have been moments when i should like to go and kneel down by your father's grave he did perhaps a better thing than he knew when he put it into my power to marry a poor man a man who has borne his poverty with such dignity with such indifference mr osmond has never scrambled nor struggled he has cared for no worldly prize if that's to be narrow if that's to be selfish then it's very well i'm not frightened by such words i'm not even displeased i'm only sorry that you should make a mistake others might have done so but i'm surprised that you should you might know a gentleman when you see one you might know a fine mind mr osmond makes no mistakes he knows everything he understands everything but he has the kindest gentlest highest spirit you've got hold of some false idea it's a pity but i can't help it it regards you more than me isabel paused a moment looking at her cousin with an eye illumined by a sentiment which contradicted the careful calmness of her manner a mingled sentiment to which the angry pain excited by his words and the wounded pride of having needed to justify a choice of which she felt only the nobleness and purity equally contributed though she paused ralph said nothing he saw she had more to say she was grand but she was highly solicitous she was indifferent but she was all in a passion what sort of person should you have liked me to marry she asked suddenly you talk about one soaring and sailing but if one marries at all one touches the earth one has human feelings and needs one has a heart in one's bosom and one must marry a particular individual your mother has never forgiven me for not having come to a better understanding with lord warburton and she's horrified at my contenting myself with a person who has none of his great advantages no property no title no honours no houses nor lands nor position nor reputation nor brilliant belongings of any sort it's the total absence of all these things that pleases me mr osmond simply a very lonely a very cultivated and a very honest man he's not a prodigious proprietor ralph had listened with great attention as if everything she said merited deep consideration but in truth he was only half thinking of the things she said he was for the rest simply accommodating himself to the weight of his total impression the impression of her ardent good faith she was wrong but she believed she was deluded but she was dismally consistent it was wonderfully characteristic of her that having invented a fine theory about gilbert osmond she loved him not for what he really possessed but for his very poverties dressed out as honours ralph remembered what he had said to his father about wishing to put it into her power to meet the requirements of her imagination he had done so and the girl had taken full advantage of the luxury poor ralph felt sick he felt ashamed isabel had uttered her last words with a low solemnity of conviction which virtually terminated the discussion and she closed it formally by turning away and walking back to the house ralph walked beside her and they passed into the court together and reached the big staircase here he stopped and isabel paused 
turning on him a face of elation, absolutely and perversely of gratitude. His opposition had made her own conception of her conduct clearer to her. "'Shall you not come up to breakfast?' she asked. "'No, I want no breakfast. I'm not hungry.' "'You ought to eat,' said the girl. "'You live on air.' "'I do, very much, and I shall go back into the garden and take another mouthful. "'I came thus far simply to say this. "'I told you last year that if you were to get into trouble, "'I should feel terribly sold. "'That's how I feel to-day.' "'Do you think I'm in trouble?' "'One's in trouble when one's in error.' "'Very well,' said Isabel. I shall never complain of my trouble to you. And she moved up the staircase. Ralph, standing there with his hands in his pockets, followed her with his eyes. Then the lurking chill of the high-walled court struck him, and made him shiver, so that he returned to the garden to breakfast on the Florentine sunshine. End of chapter 34 Chapter 35 Isabel, when she strolled in the Cascine with her lover, felt no impulse to tell him how little he was approved at Palazzo Crescentini. The discreet opposition offered to her marriage by her aunt and her cousin made on the whole no great impression upon her. The moral of it was simply that they disliked Gilbert Osmond. This dislike was not alarming to Isabel. She scarcely even regretted it, for it served mainly to throw into higher relief the fact in every way so honourable, that she married to please herself. One did other things to please other people. One did this for a more personal satisfaction, and Isabel's satisfaction was confirmed by her lover's admirable good conduct. Gilbert Osmond was in love, and he had never deserved less than during these still bright days, each of them numbered, which preceded the fulfilment of his hopes, the harsh criticism passed upon him by Ralph Touchett. The chief impression produced on Isabel's spirit by this criticism was that the passion of love separated its victim terribly from every one but the loved object. She felt herself disjoined from every one she had ever known before, from her two sisters, who wrote to express a dutiful hope that she would be happy, and a surprise somewhat more vague at her not having chosen a consort who was the hero of a richer accumulation of anecdote from Henrietta, who, she was sure, would come out too late on purpose to remonstrate, from Lord Warburton, who would certainly console himself, and from Caspar Goodwood, who perhaps would not, from her aunt, who had cold, shallow ideas about marriage, for which she was not sorry to display her contempt, and from Ralph, whose talk about having great views for her was surely but a whimsical cover for a personal disappointment. Ralph apparently wished her not to marry at all. That was what it really meant, because he was amused with the spectacle of her adventures as a single woman. His disappointment made him say angry things about the man she had preferred even to him. Isabel flattered herself that she believed Ralph had been angry. It was the more easy for her to believe this, because, as I say, she had now little free or unemployed emotion for minor needs, and accepted as an incident of her lot the idea that to prefer Gilbert Osmond as she preferred him was perforce to break all other ties. She tasted of the sweets of this preference, and they made her conscious almost with awe of the invidious and remorseless tide of the charmed and possessed condition, great as was the traditional honour and imputed virtue of being in love. It was the tragic part of happiness, one's right was always made the wrong of someone else. The elation of success, which surely now flamed high in Osmond, emitted meanwhile very little smoke for so brilliant a blaze. Contentment on his part took no vulgar form. Excitement, in the most self-conscious of men, was a kind of ecstasy of self-control. This disposition, however, made him an admirable lover. It gave him a constant view of the smitten and dedicated state. He never forgot himself, as I say, and so he never forgot to be graceful and tender, to wear the appearance, which presented indeed no difficulty, of stirred senses and deep intentions. He was immensely pleased with his young lady, 
Madame Merle had made him a present of incalculable value. What could be a finer thing to live with than a high spirit attuned to softness? For would not the softness be all for oneself, and the strenuousness for society which admired the air of superiority? What could be a happier gift than a companion, than a quick fanciful mind, which saved one repetitions and reflected one's thought on a polished elegant surface? Osmond hated to see his thought reproduced literally. That made it look stale and stupid. He preferred it to be freshened in the reproduction even as words by music. His egotism had never taken the crude form of desiring a dull wife. This lady's intelligence was to be a silver plate, not an earthen one, a plate that he might heap up with ripe fruits, to which it would give a decorative value, so that talk might become for him a sort of served dessert. He found the silver quality in this perfection in Isabel. He could tap her imagination with his knuckle and make it ring. He knew perfectly, though he had not been told, that their union enjoyed little favour with the girl's relations. But he had always treated her so completely as an independent person that it hardly seemed necessary to express regret for the attitude of her family. Nevertheless, one morning he made an abrupt allusion to it. "'It's the difference in our fortune they don't like,' he said. "'They think I'm in love with your money.' "'Are you speaking of my aunt, of my cousin?' Isabel asked. "'How do you know what they think?' "'You've not told me they're pleased, and when I wrote to Mrs. Touchett the other day she never answered my note. If they had been delighted, I should have had some sign of it.' and the fact of my being poor and you rich is the most obvious explanation of their reserve. But of course when a poor man marries a rich girl, he must be prepared for imputations. I don't mind them. I only care for one thing, for your not having the shadow of a doubt. I don't care what people of whom I ask nothing think. I'm not even capable, perhaps, of wanting to know." I've never so concerned myself, God forgive me, and why should I begin to-day, when I have taken to myself a compensation for everything? I won't pretend I'm sorry you're rich. I'm delighted. I delight in everything that's yours, whether it be money or virtue. Money's a horrid thing to follow, but a charming thing to meet. It seems to me, however, that I've sufficiently proved the limits of my itch for it. I never in my life tried to earn a penny and I ought to be less subject to suspicion than most of the people one sees grubbing and grabbing. I suppose it's their business to suspect, that of your family. It's proper on the whole they should. They'll like me better some day, so will you, for that matter. Meanwhile, my business is not to make myself bad blood, but simply to be thankful for life and love. It has made me better loving you, he said on another occasion, it has made me wiser and easier, and, I won't pretend to deny, brighter and nicer and even stronger. I used to want a great many things before, and to be angry I didn't have them. Theoretically, I was satisfied, as I once told you. I flattered myself I had limited my wants. But I was subject to irritation. I used to have morbid, sterile, hateful fits of hunger, of desire. Now I'm really satisfied because I can't think of anything better. It's just as when one has been trying to spell out a book in the twilight, and suddenly the lamp comes in. I had been putting out my eyes over the book of life, and finding nothing to reward me for my pains. But now that I can read it properly, I see it's a delightful story. My dear girl, I can't tell you how life seems to stretch there before us. What a long summer afternoon awaits us, it's the latter half of an Italian day, with a golden haze and the shadows just lengthening, and that divine delicacy in the light, the air, the landscape, which I have loved all my life, and which you love to-day. Upon my honour, I don't see why we shouldn't get on. We've got what we like, to say nothing of having each other. We've the faculty of admiration and several capital convictions. We're not stupid, we're not mean, we're not under bonds to any kind of ignorance or dreariness. You're remarkably fresh, and I'm remarkably well-seasoned. We've my poor child to abuse us. We'll try and make up some little life for her. It's all soft and mellow. 
it has the italian colouring they made a good many plans but they left themselves also a good deal of latitude it was a matter of course however that they should live for the present in italy it was in italy that they had met italy had been a party to their first impressions of each other and italy should be a party to their happiness osmond had the attachment of old acquaintance and isabel the stimulus of new which seemed to assure her a future at a high level of consciousness of the beautiful the desire for unlimited expansion had been succeeded in her soul by the sense that life was vacant without some private duty that might gather one's energies to a point she had told ralph she had seen life in a year or two and that she was already tired not of the act of living but of that of observing what had become of all her ardours her aspirations her theories her high estimate of her independence and her incipient conviction that she should never marry these things had been absorbed in a more primitive need a need the answer to which brushed away numberless questions yet gratified infinite desires it simplified the situation at a stroke it came down from above like the light of the stars and it needed no explanation there was explanation enough in the fact that he was her lover her own and that she should be able to be of use to him she could surrender to him with a kind of humility she could marry him with a kind of pride she was not only taking she was giving he brought pansy with him two or three times to the cascine pansy who was very little taller than a year before and not much older that she would always be a child was the conviction expressed by her father who held her by the hand when she was in her sixteenth year and told her to go and play while he sat down a little with the pretty lady pansy wore a short dress and a long coat her hat always seemed too big for her she found pleasure in walking off with quick short steps to the end of the alley and then in walking back with a smile that seemed an appeal for approbation isabel approved in abundance and the abundance had the personal touch that the child's affectionate nature craved she watched her indications as if for herself also much depended on them pansy already so represented part of the service she could render part of the responsibility she could face her father took so the childish view of her that he had not yet explained to her the new relation in which he stood to the elegant miss archer she doesn't know he said to isabel she doesn't guess she thinks it's perfectly natural that you and i should come and walk here together simply as good friends there seems to me something enchantingly innocent in that it's the way i like her to be no i'm not a failure as i used to think i've succeeded in two things i'm to marry the woman i adore and i've brought up my child as i wished in the old way he was very fond in all things of the old way that had struck isabel as one of his fine quiet sincere notes it occurs to me that you'll not know whether you've succeeded until you've told her she said you must see how she takes your news she may be horrified she may be jealous i'm not afraid of that she's too fond of you on her own account i should like to leave her in the dark a little longer to see if it will come into her head that if we're not engaged we ought to be isabel was impressed by osmond's artistic the plastic view as it somehow appeared of pansy's innocence her own appreciation of it being more anxiously moral she was perhaps not the less pleased when he told her a few days later that he had communicated the fact to his daughter who had made such a pretty little speech oh then i shall have a beautiful sister she was neither surprised nor alarmed she had not cried as he expected perhaps she guessed it said isabel don't say that i should be disgusted if i believed that i thought it would be just a little shock but the way she took it proves that her good manners are paramount that's also what i wished you shall see for yourself to-morrow she shall make you her congratulations in person the meeting on the morrow took place at the countess gemini's 
whither pansy had been conducted by her father who knew that isabel was to come in the afternoon to return a visit made her by the countess on learning that they were to become sisters-in-law calling at casa touchet the visitor had not found isabel at home but after our young woman had been ushered into the countess's drawing-room pansy arrived to say that her aunt would presently appear pansy was spending the day with that lady who thought her of an age to begin to learn how to carry herself in company it was isabel's view that the little girl might have given lessons in deportment to her relative and nothing could have justified this conviction more than the manner in which pansy acquitted herself while they waited together for the countess her father's decision the year before had finally been to send her back to the convent to receive the last graces and madame catherine had evidently carried out her theory that pansy was to be fitted for the great world papa has told me that you've kindly consented to marry him said this excellent woman's pupil it's very delightful i think you'll suit very well you think i shall suit you you'll suit me beautifully but what i mean is that you and papa will suit each other you're both so quiet and so serious you're not so quiet as he or even as madame merle but you're more quiet than many others he should not for instance have a wife like my aunt she's always in motion in agitation to-day especially you'll see when she comes in they told us at the convent it was wrong to judge our elders but i suppose there's no harm if we judge them favourably you'll be a delightful companion for papa for you too i hope isabel said i speak first of him on purpose i've told you already what i myself think of you i liked you from the first i admire you so much that i think it will be a good fortune to have you always before me you'll be my model i shall try to imitate you though i'm afraid it will be very feeble i'm very glad for papa he needed something more than me without you i don't see how he could have got it you'll be my stepmother but we mustn't use that word they're always said to be cruel but i don't think you'll ever so much as pinch or even push me i'm not afraid at all my good little pansy said isabel gently i shall be ever so kind to you a vague inconsequent vision of her coming in some odd way to need it had intervened with the effect of a chill very well then i've nothing to fear the child returned with her note of prepared promptitude what teaching she had had it seemed to suggest or what penalties for non-performance she dreaded her description of her aunt had not been incorrect the countess gemini was further than ever from having folded her wings she entered the room with a flutter through the air and kissed isabel first on the forehead and then on each cheek as if according to some ancient prescribed rite she drew the visitor to a sofa and looking at her with a variety of turns of the head began to talk very much as if seated brush in hand before an easel she were applying a series of considered touches to a composition of figures already sketched in if you expect me to congratulate you i must beg you to excuse me i don't suppose you care if i do or not i believe you're supposed not to care through being so clever for all sorts of ordinary things but i care myself if i tell fibs i never tell them unless there's something rather good to be gained i don't see what's to be gained with you especially as you wouldn't believe me i don't make professions any more than i make paper flowers or flouncy lampshades i don't know how my lampshades would be sure to take fire my roses and my fibs to be larger than life i'm very glad for my own sake that you're to marry osmond but i won't pretend i'm glad for yours you're very brilliant you know that's the way you're always spoken of you're an heiress and very good-looking and original not banal so it's a good thing to have you in the family our family's very good you know osmond will have told you that and my mother was rather distinguished she was called the american corinne but we're dreadfully fallen i think and perhaps you'll pick us up 
I've great confidence in you. There are ever so many things I want to talk to you about. I never congratulate any girl on marrying. I think they ought to make it somehow not quite so awful a steel trap. I suppose Pansy oughtn't to hear all this, but that's what she has come to me for, to acquire the tone of society. There's no harm in her knowing what horrors she may be in for. When first I got an idea that my brother had designs on you, I thought of writing to you to recommend you in the strongest terms not to listen to him. Then I thought it would be disloyal, and I hate anything of that kind. Besides, as I say, I was enchanted for myself, and after all, I'm very selfish. By the way, you won't respect me, not one little mite, and we shall never be intimate. I should like it, but you won't. Some day, all the same, we shall be better friends than you will believe at first. My husband will come and see you, though, as you probably know, he's on no sort of terms with Osmond. He's very fond of going to see pretty women, but I'm not afraid of you. In the first place, I don't care what he does. In the second, you won't care a straw for him. He won't be a bit at any time your affair, and, stupid as he is, he'll see you're not his. Some day, if you can stand it, I'll tell you all about him. Do you think my niece ought to go out of the room? Pansy, go and practice a little in my boudoir. Let her stay, please, said Isabel. I would rather hear nothing that Pansy may not. End of chapter 35